Beginning in verse 1, if you're there, can you say amen? amen? Paul writes this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, the word of the Lord says, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it'll pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. Verse 13, the last one we'll read today. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three. But the greatest of these is love. One more time. Can we read that together? So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is, it's love. I think 1 Corinthians chapter 13 gives us a clear picture of what real love is. Want to know what love looks like? Want to know what love acts like? What's a good definition of love? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's talk about it for the next uh, few minutes together and the next couple of weeks as we dive into this series of real love. In fact, as we start today, uh, week one, we titled this message, A Better View. A Better View. If you're taking notes, maybe you can write that down, A Better View. And we just believe we can all get a better view on love. And when we do, I believe all of our relationships uh, will be so much better because of it. So today, no matter where you are, whether you're single, married, dating, divorced, I believe uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 can speak to all of our lives because we're going to start with the individual self. Let's pray, and then we'll begin. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank you. We love you. Thank you for this day. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for every service in spite of the weather. Uh, thank you for our church. I pray that you keep everybody uh, safe as we've tried to drive through thunderstorms and whatnot. Um, God, I thank you for the gathering of your church. I thank you that it's happening all across the world on a day like today. Jesus, be magnified. Jesus, be lifted high in all of our gatherings that people may see you. Thank you, God, for this brand new series as we uh, look at you. You are love. And so help us to understand that and walk that out in our life. And thank you for loving people like us. There's nothing that we can do to earn it, to deserve it. Um, but you have been kind and gracious to each and every single one of us. And for that... Uh, all of us here at Calvary, we just say thank you, thank you, thank you. We love you, and we thank you. We give you all the praise and all the glory, and all of Calvary Church says... Amen. Come on, all of Calvary Church says... Amen. Can you make some noise for Jesus? Come on, 1 p.m. So, so to begin with a little bit of history on me and Diana, um, we met this September is going to be 16 years ago. 16 years ago, we met. Um, this November is going to be 15 years of... Of marriage. We were just children. We were absolutely we're still very young. We were still young, but we were younger. <laughs> um, by the way, we are far from perfect, but we're on a journey like you. And so 16 years ago, um, I met Diana and uh, fell in love with her as soon as I saw her. And a year later, we were married. And I, I'll never forget, I, we were in a young adult ministry. I've shared this story before. I was sitting kind of like where Justin is, between Justin and Corral, in a front row, kind of just like that. I was in the front row sitting next to my best friend. A mutual friend of ours said, hey, I'm bringing um, this friend that I think you're going to like tonight. And um, they walked in. They walked in. We had a side entrance. It was before service. She walked in. She was right in front of me. 
and I looked at my best friend and I said, that's the girl I'm going to marry. I just knew it. I said, that's the girl I'm going to marry. So we talked afterwards and she wanted to marry me that day. I love telling the real story now instead of adding those little things. It's coming. Um, <laughs> she didn't leave me alone and <laughs> here we are 16 years later. I can't escape her. And, uh, but it was, I think we have a quick picture of when we met. This is maybe a couple of months after we met. Um, a few months. The year is 2008. And I think that was November 2008 or, or something. <laughs> That's how you know I'm from Hialeah, that beard right there. Thank God for his grace and love. And... But that was us uh, 16 years ago, maybe a month or two after knowing each other. And I told you, she didn't leave me alone. Um, we used to go to Chili's a lot. We used to go to Chili's with our friends yeah. and hang out afterwards after youth. Uh, you, get, you guys can take the pictures now. Uh, but... <laughs> But then a year later, got married, and um, yeah, it's been awesome. There's been a lot of a learning. There has been a lot of learning. And, and all of you who are here, whether you are married or in a long-term uh, relationship, and you're not married yet, but you know, there, there's challenges that come. Those first few months are awesome, and there's a lot of fun. You stay on the phone till 5, 6 o'clock in the morning, but, but then you learn. Because you couldn't leave me alone. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the 1 p.m. You never know what's going to happen. No, stop thinking about what to say next. Just keep going. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm sorry, I was focused on Jesus and what yeah, we're trying yeah. to say. But, but we've learned, and we've had to learn, and, and all of us, right? you got to learn um, the differences that we all bring to relationships. You're much different than your partner, your spouse, and we all come from different backgrounds. And so we've had to learn. We have very different personalities. Um, maybe not at times, we have different personalities, and we've had to navigate that. Yeah, the main thing is, as you can see, Alex is an extrovert, right? He's just fun and, and loud. Not, all the, not and all the time. Most of the time. And so as an extrovert, he gets, you know, energy from being around people. Yeah. Like, he just, I, on the other hand. I love people. I love people. <laughs> I am an introvert. Any introverts here? Oh, wow. It's All just a three few of, of us. The introverts don't want to raise their hands because they're introverts. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but as introverts, you know, we need a little more planning, prepping in our minds, you know, what's going to happen. We just, you know, it takes a little bit longer. And so because Alex is an, extro an extrovert, he will come up with just random meetings and gatherings, you know, like people are coming over in 20 minutes. You know, and then if you're an introvert, you're like, wait, uh, uh, 20 minutes, uh, okay. And then you just have to clean up your house, right? You want to make sure, you know, everything's clean and nice. And I know that I'm not speaking for myself when I say that all of us probably have that one closet or one drawer where we just stuff everything in there when you have 10 or 15 minutes to get the house ready. Anybody with me? Anybody agree? Come on. It's Excuse like you wanna... me for loving people and wanting people oh over the gosh. house. Oh, my gosh. I, I love people, that's why I have stuffed things in yeah. closets and drawers. You need a better view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. He doesn't want to get me started in the service. <laughs> Is this therapy? Anyways. anyways I will say there'll what? be less to clean up if somebody didn't have an Amazon shopping addiction. To which I say, I am a good wife, and as a good wife, I am saving us money and gas, and time by having what we need delivered to our home. You're... I'm gonna call you DJ Laz. The way you spin that, that was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> wow, what a way of spin, I'm saving. <laughs> we are, we are saving. I don't see the savings. We are saving. Um, back, to, back to what learning we're together. About. Yes, yeah, we're, we're learning, learning and we're growing. Honestly, learning. Journey. And so our lives could be much like that, right? We could look good on the outside, but people won't really get to know what's hiding on the inside, what things we're hiding and putting away that we don't want people to see. No, I, I spoke a little bit about that last week. I spoke about, it was the last week, the week before, uh, our garage being absolutely uh, stuffed with all kinds of stuff that we had to put away. And people are coming over the house, and it don't look like we have a clean house, but many of us have been there. It's like, you haven't opened up that drawer and that door, and please don't, because... All kind of boxes will fall on you. Um, and so me and Anna were having this conversation this week, and we said, wow, relationships can be the same exact way, where we put up a projection or a front that we're good, 
or that we look good on the exterior, but on the interior, we can be a mess. And I think we, we just have to be careful with that because life is far more than projections or images for people to see. Especially in this social media driven world, anybody can put up a picture and it can look like you have your life together. But how many of us know behind that picture, there's a drawer full of garbage. <laughs> and so we said, let's start individually because we can look good on a picture. We can go outside and pretend like everything's okay. But how am I doing at the individual level? Alex by myself or Diana by herself or, or you by yourself uh, 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 away from your spouse or your partner, you at the individual level, at your core, are you doing okay? How's your soul? Do we have a healthy view of marriage, of love, of forgiveness, of God? Because maybe some of us in here, we have a broken view. We come with traumas of the past, experiences of the past, maybe dysfunction of the past, and that has shaped or that is shaping what we think we want to get into, what we want to build, and it may come from an unhealthy place. And so before even working on us or us looking good or whatever, I need to work on me. Am I healthy at the individual level? You understand what I'm saying? In fact, we put it this way today, because a broken view would never lead to a healthy reality. A broken me will actually lead to a broken outcome. My perception of love is going to dictate my direction of love. What I perceive love to be, what I think love looks like, is going to dictate where I go in this relationship. So before I go on a journey with my partner or my spouse on what I think love is, I need to first fix the issues in me. I think our culture, our world, we, we just have to be careful. As we start this series, let's talk about it. We have to be careful because I think many times we look for answers outside before we address the inside. And this is how the world lives, right? Like all of us, we've been there. We, we look for things on the outside to fix what really only the healer of the soul can fix. And what we said is, and I love this line because I really believe it's true, is that a healthy me will actually make a healthy us. Or a broken me will never lead to a healthy us. I need to make sure I'm healthy first. Yeah, and the reality is that all of us want to have successful relationships, right? We all want to have successful marriages, friendships, our families to be great. But outside success really begins with an inside transformation, our souls need to be healthy. Our souls need to be healed. Because the state of our soul will often show in our relationships. And we have a God that wants to be part of that process. Who wants to, to heal areas of our lives that need healing. And so one of the things that we need to do is that we need to just break with this idea that someone else is going to come and fix us. I think many times we've heard that, that idea of like, you know, if I find the right person, then I'll change these things in my life. If I find the right person, then my life will be different. If I, and we need to break that idea and really begin to take responsibility for ourselves first, right? If all of us, if the two of us begin to take responsibility for ourselves first, then together our relationships will have a different outcome. They will succeed. And the beautiful thing is that God wants that for us. He wants us to be healed, but he doesn't want us to walk around with filled drawers in our lives, with our hearts filled with, with things that don't belong there, with hurt, with, with hangups, with habits, with traumas from the past. He wants to set us free so that we can walk into everything that he has for us. And so good relationships are possible. Love, real love, it's possible because we have a God that has real love towards us. Like the verses we just read, that is the kind of love that he wants us to experience as well. And so we need to remember today that strong relationships first begin with the right foundation. And if we're honest here today, how many of us can look at our lives and say, I don't have the right foundation. My foundation is broken. My foundation has the wrong view. If we can be honest with ourselves today, and many times it isn't even because of something we have done, although it could be, but many times our foundations are broken because of things that 
have happened in our lives because of the way we were brought up, because of things that we had to experience, because of pain that happened in our lives. And so our view of love and our view of relationships can be a little different than that which God wants for our lives. But the great thing that God wants us to know today is that regardless of what our foundation looks like today, he can begin to lay a new foundation in our lives, one that is whole, one that is healed, one that is complete, and that he has the power to go into every broken area of our lives, those areas filled with pain, that area of trauma, and he can heal it because he is a healer. And it doesn't matter how old you are in this place, how long you've been married, not married, God is a God of second chances and of new beginnings. And he will be more than willing to meet you where you are. If only we're open to him and going through a process with him where we allow him to work into our lives. And so today, God can help us lay a new foundation in which we can build better relationships. Because if I get healthy, then we can get better. I think that's that's been um, part of our story, right? For 16 years, it's... Maybe we both came in with different views, uh, different experiences. Yeah. And so for us, it's been like, okay, let's always go back to what we believe is the Word of God, infallible. It's the ultimate authority. It's full of wisdom. Let's go back to that. And that will define what real love looks like. And so for us, it's a constant going back to this. And we just read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And how many of you heard 1 Corinthians chapter 13 before? You've heard it somewhere. Yeah, maybe at a wedding uh, at an engagement party, you know, we love reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm, I've done a bunch of weddings and couples will be like, can you read 1 Corinthians chapter 13? And I'm like, absolutely, I'll read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 at the wedding. And, you know, people will cry and they'll love it. And it's like, I love 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's so beautiful. <laughs> but, but I think sometimes we don't really understand it. Because how many know to read something, you got to read it in context, what is, why is Paul writing this? It's not that Paul got romantic one day and decided to write on love. There's a reason why he's writing this. He's writing to a church in a city called Corinth. The city is wild, and the church has gotten wild, right? Like doing church in the wild, and now there's wild in the church, right? They, they're crazy. The church has lost its mind. Paul says it's actually worse when you gather together. That's embarrassing. Paul's like, what are you guys doing on Sunday? You guys gather together and it's a mess. He's like, some of you are getting drunk off communion. That's happening. Some of us were looking for more communion cups this morning. Like, <laughs> so that's what he's talking about. He's like, you, you go to the table to get drunk, the table of communion, and you're looking down on the poor people in your gatherings. In fact, you eat of the love feast and you leave none for the poor. He's actually correct. It's actually a pretty harsh letter. He's correcting a lot of stuff. So chapter 13, he's correcting them on love. It's actually not a romantic letter. It's a letter saying, you got all these things that are messed up, including how you love people. So, so 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he's like, hey, okay, it looks like you're doing good on the outside. You're gathering, your Sunday gatherings, they're, they're going amazing. They're amazing. You're at a parking, growth track is full, dream team's amazing. You got three services. It looks like church is going absolutely phenomenal. But guess what? You speak in tongues, you prophesy, but you don't love well. And if you do all that, but you don't love well, guess what? You're doing nothing right. <laughs> and I think humans, right, we're really good, as we were talking about putting a good exterior and defining success on what we do in the exterior. Paul, what do you mean? Look at us. We speak in tongues. Look at us. We all dance. We all, like, you do all these things. He goes, you know what you got wrong? Love. Because you're loving based on human love. But the love he's talking about here is God's love. Our English language has one word for love, and that's just love. And we use that word for everything we love. So I say, I love Diana the same way I say, I love my dog. But I love Diana way differently than I love my dog, <laughs> right? You say you love your parents or you love your spouse, but you also say you love ice cream. And I'm sure there's different kinds of love in what you mean. But in the Greek, which Paul is writing in, there's three words that they use for love. One of them is the word eros, E-R-O-S, right? And, and that means romantic love is where we get our English word erotic, right? That's romantic, uh, sexual love, 
right? And so, some of us are like, oh, preach on that. That's good, pastor. Preach on that. <laughs> Next week. Uh, no. That's not the word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Then there's phileo. That's friendship or brotherly love, right? That's, that's not the word he's using there either. He's using the Greek word agape. Agape. When he says love is patient, he's saying agape is patient. Now, that's not romantic. That's not brotherly love. That's actually divine love. He's talking about God. It's funny because the same word agape there is the same word that the apostle John uses in his letter in 1 John chapter 4 when he says God is love. He's saying God is agape, that kind of love. That kind of love is almost impossible to live up to. It's a self-denying type love. It's a, it's a love that demands action, one commentator put. That type of love, real love, it, it means dying to yourself and doing something even when you don't want to do it. That type of love is not based on the other person. That type of love is based on you. So, so let's talk about real love. We want to talk about butterflies and roses and balloons. No, wait first. Let's talk about agape. It begins with me. How do I treat my neighbor? How do I treat my spouse? How do I treat my friend? Do I have divine love? Do I have the divine love from God? Or do I just look at romantic love or friendship love without, based on myself, my actions? So Paul's like, hey, you want to know love? I'm going to give you a really good definition of love. Paul says, I'm going to, I'm going to write it down so this crazy messed up church has a picture of what we're supposed to look like. I'm glad you speak in tongues. I'm glad you prophesy. But he says, love is actually patient, kind. Guess what? It does not envy or boast. It's not irritable. It does not insist on its own way. How many know you've been married for 16 years? You're going to want your own way sometimes. Diana's come a long way since then. But, but I, <laughs> to love like God, that's not on her. That's on me. And vice versa. It begins at the individual level. What drawer do I have full of all kind of issues from the past that I'm putting that on her when it really begins with me to act and love and think like God? So today, we're starting this series, and um, we came up with three handles that we think can help us as we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We want to make it really easy and practical, things that have helped us in our 16-year journey that hopefully can help you. Uh, but we'll give you three quick handles, and then we'll, we'll worship one more time. The first one is we need to seek the one. Right. Seek the one. Look at your neighbor and tell them, seek the one. Uh, what do I mean by that? And what we were talking about was, our culture is really big on the one. You've heard that term before. I was a youth pastor here for two years. Before that, I was involved in youth and young adult ministry probably well over 15 years. So um, it, it's, it's around a lot of young people's language. I remember being a, a youth leader, a young adult leader, or a youth pastor. And people will always come up to me or come up to me in the end and be like, hey, I'm looking for the one. I want the one. Or they'll, they'll start, they'll, they'll meet somebody they like. Pastor, can you help me pray? Is this the one? Is this the one? I just want to know if it's the one. God, if it's the one, let them look my way. <gasps> it's the one. Like a confirmation. <laughs> like we play all these kind of games. And I, I, I get that, but I don't necessarily agree. Um, I think we're busy looking for the one when we should be seeking the one while getting ready for the two. If you seek the one, you'll be way more prepared for the number two that God's going to bring in your life. In worldly terms, yes, she's first in my life. But when it comes to our entire being, spiritual people, God's first in my life. You got to be careful because if not, we make idols out of people and we put them in pedestals. They, they do not, they can't even fill. Because if I rely on Diana to fix the drawers of my soul, I'm putting a title on her that is not real. Only God can fix my soul. And so many of us, we look for a person to heal and make us whole when it's only the maker of the soul that can do that. And so my spouse, my partner, my best friend, yes, absolutely. But they don't come to complete me. They come to complement what God has already done. If you're single in here, can I tell you? You already are complete in God. 
Don't let culture or the world tell you that singleness is something less than. No, you are made completely and whole in Jesus. Seek the one. Seek the one. You put him first. In fact, as we seek the one, we start finding out what real love looks like. So that when number two comes along, you'll be way more prepared. We'll all be healthier and better. Those drawers will begin to start to get cleaned out. That garage will start to get cleaned out in our soul because I've been seeking the one because to know God is to know love. You and I, we want to love correctly? Know God. He is love, the Bible says. He is agape. More than romantic. In that stage that we showed that picture, that was romantic love for sure. Like, and we still have that, absolutely. But um, that stage will go by like this. And then there's absolutely phileo love and friendships. We crack up like dummies together at the dumbest things, right? That's fun. But when the challenges come, you need agape love. And so for us, it's like, let's seek the one above everything else. And that's going to build a foundation in our life so that when life gets hard, we know what real love looks like. And let's go back to that. That's why Jesus in Matthew chapter 7, he says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And then he'll give you everything else you need. And that's true. We've seen that in our own lives. Yeah, so the question we need to ask ourselves today is how are we seeking God? Are we seeking God? Or is God to us just this far off being that we just remember whenever we have some challenge in our lives? And we go about our lives and then something happens and then we remember that God, maybe God can't help me. Or are we really seeking a relationship with Him? Are we really seeking God? Because the difference that this makes in our lives is that as we get to know God, He begins to reveal His character to us, who He is, what love is, what He thinks. But as that happens, He also begins to reveal who we are. And it is then that we realize the value that he's given us, how we should carry ourselves, but also the way that he wants us to live in freedom, in wholeness, in health. And through this journey is that he begins to work out in those areas of our lives, those drawers full of issues and situations. It is through a relationship with him that he can then begin to work in our lives as we're open and honest, but it takes us seeking him and opening our lives to correction opening our lives to hear things that sometimes we don't want to hear when God confronts us and tells us hey this this is wrong hey this you need to change hey this area although painful you need to go back and revisit because you need to heal it it is only as we seek the one but the number two what we need to do is to self-reflect self-reflect you know before you go on um, an airplane you have to check your bags Right? There's things you can't take with you. There's a certain uh, weight limit. And about a year ago, Alex and I were um, taking a flight somewhere with our baby. And if you have kids, you know, you have to pack a whole lot of stuff if you're taking kids with you. So, you know, I I've always seen those people that go up to the counter and they hold up the line for 30 minutes because they got to open their luggage and transfer things, you know. And I'm not going to say I was judging them, but I was judging them. I'm like with the line 30 minutes until that person was me until I found myself at the counter my luggage was exceeding the weight limit and then I have to begin to figure out okay what do I put this put this in your backpack we're five pounds overweight let, let me change this let me switch and, and 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 those restrictions are there for a reason they're there for our safety and it is the same principle that we need to carry into our lives what are you bringing with you have you checked your luggage? What are you dragging into your relationships? What trauma, pain, situation, habit from the past are you dragging with you into your present and into your relationship? We need to self-reflect. Self-reflect is asking ourselves those difficult questions. Why am I this way? Why do I react in this, in this manner to, to, to other people in my relationships? Because here's what we do. We often point out everyone else's issue and we fail to recognize our own issues. It's easy to say, well, you don't do this. You're this kind of person. You need to speak differently. You need, and we fail to look inside and take responsibility for the one thing we can change and that is ourselves. 
So how do we self-reflect? We begin to ask ourselves the hard questions, the painful questions, the uncomfortable questions. Am I carrying that trauma from the past? Am I still holding on to that situation, to that pain? Because the reality is that hurt people hurt people. And the way that I'm gonna show up to my relationships is the way that I feel inside. And so I love this verse, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, it says this, search me God and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So how do we still reflect today? We do that. Search me God. God, search my heart, my soul, and see what is there in me that needs to change. See what, what is there in me that needs to be confronted by you. What is there in me that needs, that needs healing, that needs changing. And it's not always going to be easy, but it's always going to be worth it. Because it's going to change the quality, not just of our lives, but our relationships. So that we can bring something else to the table for our families, for ourselves, and for the people around us. I think that's such a good handle. Um, in the last maybe 10 years of us um, trying to help couples, counseling, pastoral, with people that we love and are trying to help out, we've noticed so many times when a couple does start arguing or bringing up a discussion, and you're absolutely right. We blame the other person. And we start, and we've done it too, right? Where we, we blame each other. It's like, wait, open up that bag. That's not them. That's you bringing all this baggage from what happened in your first marriage or what parents did to you or something that you went through, a trauma in your childhood. And it's like, you're pointing the finger at your spouse, but really, I just think your luggage has way more than you're supposed to carry into this new relationship. And so it, it messes up with the views. Me, me and you, we, we walked into our, our marriage with absolutely different views. I was born and raised here in Miami, been in church my entire life. My parents were youth pastors that became ministers. My mom was an administrative assistant in church for years. So I've been in church my entire life. As long as I can remember, I, I, won't, I couldn't miss a Sunday. If I was sick, they, they're like, don't worry, God will resurrect you in service. Um, you're going to church. So I've been in church my entire life, literally my entire life. Um, so I had an idea about love. I saw my parents. My parents have been married together now, going on 40-something years. Uh, they were here at an earlier service. I love them. They're my heroes. But, but I view love through their lens. And although it can, it can look like a successful one, I can't put that, those expectations on you. You came with a different view of love. Um, if you want to share a little bit of your experience and maybe your view when it came to love. Yeah, I had the complete opposite experience than Alex did growing up. My parents divorced when I was nine years old. And so my mom raised me after that as a single mom. My dad was out of our lives, out of my life. And so my mom was that mom and dad in my life. And because of those things, and not just their relationship, but other relationships around me, I began to form my own idea of life, of love of what I wanted for my life. And so I wasn't that little girl that dreamt of getting married and having kids and having this beautiful family. Yeah, I thought maybe one day I'd get married, but it wasn't this thing that I desired or that I looked forward to simply because I thought, well, life happens. And sometimes, you know, stories don't always end great. And people leave you and people betray you and love isn't always this beautiful thing. Can, can I interject yes. a little bit? Sorry, I'm interjecting. Either way. Either way. <laughs> So I, I apologize if I'm maybe uh, diving a little too much, but I think it'll be helpful. You had that view because you witnessed your mom working two, three full-time jobs, having nothing. You witnessed your aunts going through that. And so I think it formed in you um, a protection. Yeah. Okay, marriage is okay, but marriage can be bad. And so it's not ideal or it's not the, it wasn't the most beautiful thing or idealistic thing for you because you've witnessed a lot of hurt and pain and struggle and it shaped your view on love. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's the best way to put it is that when something happens in your life, you begin to build um, 
protections around you. And for me, it was that is you need to take care of yourself first because nobody else will. If you are not the one person that protects yourself, that takes care of yourself, then you don't know who's going to do that for you. And so before I expect a man to protect me or to care for me or to be that person in my life, I need to be that for myself. Because the day of tomorrow, if I get married and if this person walks out on me like it happened in my own life, then I'll be okay. If I worry about my career and, 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 and school and making sure that I have make a name for myself and that I have my finances in this together, I have to do this because life might happen and then what if? And so yes, there, there are things that we build around us to protect ourselves. And, and it happens naturally as the way God built us, you know? It's like fear is not always a bad thing, it's a protection also that God has given us. But the beautiful thing about it is that God is a God that redeems. It's that God is a God that uses the worst of times and the worst of pains in our lives and turns them around for good. And so sometimes we can dwell in our past and we can dwell in our pain or we can simply look at Jesus and then look at our situation and realize how blessed we have been that we have a God that has been able to change our lives around. So when I look at my life and at my past, I don't look at it with pity for myself. I can say that I love my story. As messed up or broken as it could be, I love my story because I've seen God work in my life. Like perhaps he hasn't worked in other people's lives in that sense. And so seeking the one, seeking Jesus, Jesus is a redeemer. And so what he does is redeem our stories. And it's the way that he did it in my life is that God took this broken girl and he gave her new dreams and he removed that fear. And he said, yes, life can still happen. And life might not be perfect and not everything ends in a beautiful fairy tale but you know what even then it's worth living and it's worth living without fear and it's worth living believing that God can do miraculous things and so going into this we have that and I love that I love that you have such a beautiful story with your parents and I love that I have the opposite story because it's what gives us a different perspective and it allows us to now build together what we what yeah. we want to build. But I think either way, what I thought was a good view, and maybe in your eyes, you had a bad view, what we both end up learning is we both need a better view, which is a biblical view. It's not based on our human experiences, because yes, mine could have looked good on paper because of my parents, marriage, and all that, and hers could have looked a certain way on paper, but at the end of the day, we all need a better view. And so let's go back to the blueprint. Let's get a biblical view on love. So whether you're single, married, um, divorced, wherever you're at, might maximize the season that you're in to can I Can I just say something? Sorry, I just sensed this you can just now. Me. If you're here and that's your view and you've lived your life scared, thinking that you just have to look out for yourself, afraid of what tomorrow might bring, can I just invite you to allow God to work that in your life and to believe that even if the day of tomorrow, life doesn't end up the way you wanted it to be or the way you dreamt it of being, that God is still faithful. Do not be afraid. If you are seeking God and you have a relationship with Him, walk into your future strong as that person, believing that regardless of what tomorrow might bring, God will always take care of you. God will always be faithful to you. God will always be faithful to you. So pray to God that you that He will remove that fear from your heart and from your life so that you can move through it in wholeness and fully into everything that He has for you. Don't rush the process. If you're single, don't be in a rush to get married. If you're married, don't be in a rush to say, well, my relationship doesn't look like this. Let's all work on ourselves first. Maximize the season that we're in as we seek the one as we self-reflect, and then we said uh, the last handle would be good. Uh, it's been good for us is to start building our own biblical view and our own family the way God wants it designed. Let's start building. Let's start building on the right foundation. Maybe today, I don't know, we've been talking now for 20, 20 something minutes. All you can think about is the past. Oh, well, we started the wrong way. You have no idea where we're at. You're right. I have no idea where um, a lot of us are in this room. Here's what I do know. God's a God of new beginnings. God's a God who heals. 
And I know that if today we repent, we turn to him, we can start building on the right foundation. And maybe today we've had a bunch of expectations. I think all of us, that's a big one. We go into relationships with all kinds of expectations. This is what life is going to look like. This is what I want. This is what I desire. Or this is what my marriage is going to be. And then you start walking that thing out. And you realize, well, I had some false expectations. Me and Anna, we get it from Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, uh, those of us who hear his words and build our lives, put them into practice, that's wisdom. You're not like the person that built your life on the sand because then the winds blew, the rain came, and all that fell apart. But if you put them into practice, if you, if you grab the words of Jesus, the, the words that are found in this awesome, living, holy Bible, and we put them into practice, it'll be like that person that built their life on the rock. And so I realized I can't build it on my view, she can't build it on her view, but we can build it on the biblical view. And that's the rock. The rock is Jesus. And then the winds of life are going to blow. The rain's going to come, whether that's financial problems, physical issues, um, family drama, all of that will come. It's going to happen. It's life. But if we are building and we start building right, the winds will come, the rain will come, but we, we can outlast the storm because we've decided to build our life, our marriage, our relationship on Jesus. Let's always go back. Let's always go back to the blueprint. I read a story this week on, on buildings and they were giving the example of two different buildings that were built on two different foundations. One of them was the, the London Millennium Bridge. They were in a rush to build this bridge in London and so they, in a hurry, they overlooked a lot of problems that were absolutely obvious. And they're like, let's just keep going. We need to build this bridge as soon as possible. What they, one of the biggest things they overlooked, what they didn't know was that they were building actually on sand. It wasn't a firm foundation. As soon as that bridge was completed, immediately people said they felt the bridge absolutely wobbly. It was unsafe. They had to shut it down. And then they had to go back and start fixing it because it was a wrong foundation. If we rush things or if we base our love on what culture tells us, magazine tells us, on what humanity tells us, it's going to be like that wobbly bridge and the winds and the rain will come and we're going to be like, wait, something's not right here. Yeah, we built our life on the sand. I don't know. I don't want a wobbly marriage. I don't want Arya to grow up with wobbly parents and it's like, oh, anything hits them, they're a mess. They said, look at the Roman Colosseum. It's been centuries since it was built. And the article said, the Romans must have known something about building on the rock. Because the earthquakes hit, storms have hit, and all these centuries later, hundreds of years later, it is still standing today. And it was built by people who didn't have the technology that we have today, yet it is still standing. Why? Because the foundation is solid rock. Real love, what does the Bible tell us? Is that divine love, agape. Let's go back there. Let's build our marriages. Let's build our lives. Let's build all of our relationships. Let's get a better view on love. The love of Jesus to think like him, walk like him, act like him, forgive like him. If we get that foundation, woo, love, it, it'll be a better view, I'm telling you, than whatever life has handed us. And then when the winds come and the rains blow, we'll be able to stand. And I believe we'll be able to reflect what God wants us to reflect in all of our relationships. And that's his divine love. Why don't we stand up all across this place?